looked at Eucharistic discipleship. This afternoon, we're going to focus on how the Eucharist forms and sustains us. There are some things that I said this morning that, that will be repeated. But hopefully there will be some, some new things. <clears throat> and I felt that we should just stick with the Gospel of Luke as the, as the basis section. And, and I'll make reference, of course, to John's Gospel. Because it's Luke and John that, that I've been using basically so far. So from the Gospel of Luke, we, we turn to chapter 24 from verse 13. One of the things that people, people who have come to know me is that, and I always say it, I misuse Scripture. But I misuse not abuse. <laughs> because I have two basic backgrounds in terms of academics. On the one hand, my background is English, you know, especially literature, so English literature. So I always look at things from a literary point of view. And, and so, so I'm not a biblical scholar, <laughs> but when I read scripture, I read it as an English literature person. And on the church side, my background is liturgy. <laughs> so, so I always say to people, I'm a literary liturgist. <laughs> And, and what's it about? It's, it's really making connections. And so when I say that I misuse Scripture, is that I, I look at certain things and I try to make connections. So here is the connection that I'm making. From verse 13, it says, Now that very day, and it's not literal, but I'm saying that very day, here we are together on the same day. So we're looking at another aspect of this. So that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had happened. So... That very day. It's Easter Day. It's making that reference to Easter Day. But these men could only make reference to Easter Day because they too were probably present at the upper room. Because I don't think it was just the twelve who were there. There were other persons present in the room. So they had been to the liturgy. <laughs> and so here they were. They were conversing about all the things that had occurred in that liturgy. <laughs> because in the liturgy, Jesus had given himself given himself totally and they saw that he had given himself on the cross and it happened that while they were conversing and debating Jesus himself drew near and walked with them The same Jesus who would later on say, Lo, I am with you always. 
We are those two men making our journey to our Emmaus. But Emmaus is not the destination. So they were going to Emmaus. Did they reach Emmaus? No. So what does Emmaus really represent? What does it represent? For me, Emmaus represents running away. They were running away. Emmaus represents a place for the disappointed. Emmaus represents a place for the disillusioned. Emmaus represents a place of persons who had given up hope. So they were traveling to Emmaus. And when we get to that place in our lives, what do we do? We just give up. We don't want to go on anymore. And we see that happening in so many areas of our lives. So it could be school. We want to give up on school. It could be marriage. We want to give up on our marriage. It could be our parish we want to give up on our parish. It could be so many things because we are disappointed. We are disillusioned. There is no hope, so let's give up. Let's run away. So they were going from Jerusalem, going to a place called Emmaus. Seven miles away, and seven miles, it's a long way. And why is this? Because on the Jews were not allowed to walk more than a mile on, on the Sabbath. So seven miles, it's a long way away. So it's more than a 10K run. <laughs> so they were walking and they were debating. But even as we walk towards our Emmaus, the Eucharist tells us, that Jesus walks with us. Jesus walks with us. And that is why Eucharistic people, Eucharistic disciples, are never persons who are disillusioned. Eucharistic disciples are such fools <laughs> That, as St. Paul said, we're fools for Christ. <laughs> we are people who never give up hope. So even though things go bad and go wrong, as they always will, <laughs> we know that there's hope. Because... As the Psalm 46 says, God is our hope and strength. So we know that. Therefore will we not fear though the earth be moved. <laughs> because the God of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Don't you say that? 
So Eucharistic disciples never ever give up. Although bad things happen. But even though we know what has happened, it does occur in our lives that we feel that we need to go to Emmaus and just settle down and forget about life. So Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Their eyes were prevented. So it's what was happening inside of them that closed their eyes. Because their hearts were also closed. So their eyes were closed because their hearts were closed. Are you with me? Okay. So Jesus asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, and one of them could be Frank, <laughs> or it could be Tony, <laughs> could be Joseph. It could be Phyllis, you know, whatever name we want to put there, one of them said. Because it's really questioning this person, you know. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Like we would be saying, duh, don't you know what's happening? <laughs> you know, can't you see the state that the world is in? All of these things are happening and, you're, and you don't expect us to behave like this in this disappointed manner? And Jesus said, what sort of thing? And why is Jesus saying this? Because he wants them to articulate what is happening <laughs> And so they told him what had happened. So, I mean, I know we know it and, and so forth. And, but in verse 21 it says, but we were hoping. So we were hoping. So you see where the loss of hope is? We were hoping, but that is no more. That hope is gone. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. So since it's the third day, it's over and done. So we know why we have to go back to Jerusalem, go back to, go to Emmaus. So some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. And so they went and saw things, just as the women said, but him they did not see because their hearts were closed, so their eyes could not see. That, that's not said here in the Bible, but I'm interpreting. Hmm? So they didn't see him. What had Jesus said at the Last Supper, this is my body. This is my blood. Did you see that? Did you see that last night at, at Mass or yesterday at Mass, any, any time? Did you see his body? Did you see his blood? Did you know it was Jesus? Did you recognize him? 
Because if we didn't recognize him, then we're going to go through those doors disappointed. And so what is Jesus saying to these men? Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of, how slow of heart. You see with the heart coming in there? How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. So he opened, well, he opened the scriptures. He opened the scriptures to them. Isn't this part of what happens in the Eucharist? Because the Eucharist that we celebrate, we talk about the liturgy of the Word. And that is an important part of the Eucharistic celebration. Some people believe that, you know, we should just hurry and get this part over so that we can get to the, to the big part, <laughs> the most important part. So people don't want to be bothered with the liturgy of the Word. And so they'll always ask, you know, well, why do we have to do three readings on a Sunday? Couldn't we just use one in so? Or, I've heard people say, why couldn't we just have the gospel? <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> because it's taking up time. So they don't want the scriptures to be opened. But the general instruction on the Roman Missal even says that we should have a time of silence after each reading. But... And we spoke about the silence already. But if we have that time of silence, people are going to be thinking this. Because it is for us to encounter that word. You know, I... Have you ever been to to a Catholic charismatic gathering. <laughs> I mean, and, and I'm not charismatic as in that way. But I tell you, I've been to a, a Catholic charismatic gathering in Jamaica. And after the reading, the first reading, before the response to Psalm, oh, they break into song. <laughs> oh. And it is, and there's a song that they love to sing, you know. Um, Bless thy word unto our hearts <laughs> and glorify thy name. <laughs> you know, and see all of these and they have their arms up and, and so forth. But it is that they want the word that is proclaimed to speak to them. And they're giving it time for that to happen. So Jesus went through and he opened the scriptures. Have you ever heard, and you know, there are four new Eucharistic prayers that we have in the Missal. Um, and, all, and in those four Eucharistic prayers, the words are used there where it says that Jesus opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. So, so the four Eucharistic prayers, the church on the path to unity, Jesus the way to salvation, um, you know, Jesus went about doing good. Look at, look at those sometimes. So in the Eucharist, the scriptures are opened because we encounter Jesus in word as well as in sacrament. Because Gnosis said that he pointed out to them what was said about him in the scriptures. 
So from the, from the prophets and, and Moses going all the way down. And so, then after this, when they, when they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So they are pleading with him, stay with us. So at least they are hospitable. They had learned something. So how to be hospitable. And something special happened. So verse 30 says, And it happened that while he was with them at table. Doesn't this take you back to the night of the Last Supper? That Jesus sat at table with his disciples. So while he was at table, ta-da, he did the same thing he had just done on Thursday. He took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is my body. So you see that the Eucharist becomes the place because we're talking about how we are formed and sustained by the Eucharist. So we go back to the Eucharist day by day to have that new encounter, to have our eyes opened so that we can recognize Jesus. But I said earlier on that their eyes could not see because their hearts were also closed. Right. So, and why do I say this? And why do I know that I am right? Because when Jesus vanished from their sight, they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. So you see, their hearts started to be opened by the, by the opening of the scriptures. And this is why it is so important to have the liturgy of the word. Because our people are hungering for the Word of God. And it is a very, very important part of our Eucharistic celebration. So it's not just to give some little, a few kind words. It's not about just sharing a few kind thoughts. It is about proclaiming Jesus Christ. So that people can encounter him and have their hearts opened. Because if their hearts are not open at this point, it will not be open later on to recognize him in the breaking of bread. So the proclamation of the scriptures must take place first before the proclamation of the table. So we feed at the table of the word in order to be prepared to feed at the table of the sacrament. So we are formed by that. So the word is there and then we will clearly see. So what did these men do? 
Verse 33 says, So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem. At once. So there was this sending forth. And what, what is it? They're being sent back to the world from which they were running. <laughs> to that same world. So go back. So no longer, no longer were they running away. No longer were they disappointed nor disillusioned. Their hope was now restored. Their eyes were open because their hearts were open and they were on fire. On fire. We in the Catholic Church, we need some people, all our people to be on fire. On fire for the Lord. On fire for the Eucharist. You know, um, and I don't want you to think that, that I'm up here acting. I'm not acting. <laughs> you know, because, so I, I'm not doing this because I want to get an Oscar. <laughs> I'm doing it because this is what I feel right in here. And I feel it in here because I know it. Because I know that all of this is so important for the church. So important for us. So we want to be on fire. And we want to go where no one else will go. Because we have this good news to proclaim. And so, at once they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and, and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly risen. So do you see the community? The community being formed. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the, on the way. <laughs> and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And so Jesus continues to make himself known to us in the breaking of the bread. So going back to this morning, Jesus told his disciples to go and prepare that place where he would have the Passover with his disciples. We have to prepare ourselves for that encounter. We have to. I don't know if it is in this St. Augustine hymnal, but there's one of, the, one of the other hymnals, glory and praise or whatever it is. There's a Eucharistic song, I come with joy to meet my Lord. <laughs> That's one of those songs in, in one of those books. So you see, we have to prepare ourselves for that. So it's not just... Going in to do something, to do a thing. But we're going in to meet Jesus. So if someone should meet you at the door and say, what are you doing here this morning? I've come to meet Jesus. So if Glenda decides to interview you for something for the Florida Catholic, <laughs> and she asks, why are you going to Mass? Tell her... <laughs> I come to Mass to meet Jesus. To encounter Him. And this is what we want to see during this year of the Eucharist. That people encounter Jesus. And that we make this diocese a better place. So that the Diocese of Orlando can become the leader 
of the Florida Catholic, as it, not the newspaper now. <laughs> you know. So that we can truly say to all of these people, yes, indeed, this is the center of the Catholic Church in Florida. And why not the center of Catholicism in the United States? <laughs> so, we meet this Jesus and we help others to meet him. So then, these men had another encounter with Jesus. They had their renewed vigor. They were accompanied by Jesus. And they realized that they needed that encouragement to go on their mission. And after having encountered Jesus, then they go out and they say to people by their words and by their example, we have seen the Lord. We have seen him. We just ate with him. We have seen him. And so we are formed by that Eucharist. But we want to be sustained by it. And this is why next week we are coming back. <laughs> you see, so, so we don't just go once a year or once a month. <laughs> but because it is the source and summit of all our Christian activity, I go out and I come back. Because I just can't get enough. And I'm going to keep on going out and coming back until I am at that table in heaven. <laughs> I'll just keep on doing it. Because we want people to know that this is the way to get to the kingdom of heaven. And so I think of even persons who are extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. I, there's a story that I love to share because it, it's a very painful story. <laughs> but I love to share it because I think it needs to help people. When I was in Pennsylvania, one of our brothers was sick and in hospital. And we went to the hospital to see him. And a, a woman came in and, and she said, you know, are you so-and-so, you know? called him by name, and she said yes. And she said, well, okay, I'm a, I'm a Eucharistic minister from St. So-and-so Church and so forth, so I've come to give you communion. Would you like that? And he said, sure. I mean, this brother, he's a priest, but you know what I mean. And, and she opened her pics. The body of Christ. Okay. <laughs> I'm, and I'm gone. And off she went. So just like that. <laughs> so clearly she had no idea what she was doing. And I think, and I've heard, that it happens frequently. That people just go in and they give them the biscuit <laughs> and off they go. <laughs> So that there is no true encounter with Jesus. So that sick person in the hospital doesn't feel any hope from all of this. So if we have any Eucharistic ministers here who go to the housebound or to hospitals, 
make sure that you are helping the people to have a good encounter. And even when you're in church, do not administer communion in a casual way. So that you're saying the body of Christ, but you're looking over there. The, bo the body of Christ, and you're looking to the people over there and, and so forth. Not, not having that encounter with the person in front of you. Because it's a three-way conversation taking place at that point. You, the communicant, and Jesus. And we're having a time together. Sometimes, and I've seen people come and, you know, and they, they pick the host out of your hand. You have seen that happen, right? You know, no. Where did they get their, their formation? So something has to happen where that is concerned. So, so, you see, so it's just receiving a thing, <laughs> but not receiving Jesus. But hopefully all of these will be addressed during this year of the Eucharist. So, we want to have that change. Let us meet the Lord. And so Jesus is saying to us, encounter me, receive me, and I'll be in you, I'll be walking with you. Because... He said it at the ascension. Lo, I am with you always. And therefore, we do it again and again, as I said. And we come back next week for more. <laughs> more. So it's maintenance and it's sustenance. And then Jesus says to us, now, this is in the Gospel of John. John chapter 8. And so this is where I want to bring this part to an end. Because I'm speaking to you, you who have come out to be here today. There are things that you could be doing. Because, you know, today being a coalish day, and we know how people in Florida, when, they, when it gets down to 60 degrees, <laughs> they want to turn on the fire. <laughs> you know? So you could be turning on your fireplace, you know, and just sitting and relaxing. <laughs> you know? um, someone said to me yesterday, you know, said, oh, I'm, I can't wait for it to, to, to get cool so that I can at least cook some comfort food. <laughs> so, so there are things you could be doing, but you made the effort to be here on this day. And so, John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, so I am saying to you, you Catholics who believe in Jesus, and Jesus said, if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples. So if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples. So we're talking about forming Eucharistic disciples. And we see the connection between the word and the sacrament. But Jesus didn't stop there. And he said, and you will know the truth. You will know the truth. 
In another place he said, my word is truth. Also in another place he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, so it is him that we'll get to know. And he said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And set you free for what? In the, in the Benedictus, you know, the Song of Zechariah, it says, set us free to worship him without fear. That's why we want to be free. That is true religious freedom, <laughs> to worship him without fear. And it didn't stop there. It says, holy and righteous all the days of our life. Holy and righteous all the days of our lives. And what is it to be holy? To be holy means to be separated to God for God and God alone. So when we talk about the church as the holy people of God, it means that we exist for God and for God alone and for nothing else and for no one else. So, so my sisters and brothers, I'm exhorting you to be holy, holy disciples that you belong to God and to nobody else. That you're here to serve him and no one else because God says, I am the Lord your God and you shall have no other God beside me. So it's, it's all connected. And the, and the Eucharist brings all of that to mind for us. So we will become truly formed. We will be sustained through it. So we have to, we have to just keep on coming so that eventually we will make it. So that's where I'm going to, to end this session. We can have a time for if you have any, any questions or any comments, we can deal with that. And then you have time for your, your personal moment with God. And at, the, and at 2.30, we'll have the Eucharistic adoration and benediction to close the day. So, any questions and, you know, um, anything for, for clarification? There is a part in, in Scripture, and, and unfortunately, I don't know Scripture that well that I could say that, that this is in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 5, you know, whatever it is. But in the Scripture, there's a part that says, the Lord in his, is in his holy temple. Let the earth keep silence before him. And, and so silence becomes a natural way of approaching the Lord. Silence fosters that encounter with the Lord. It also fosters the encounter with, with one another. Because very often we speak out of our anxiety. People get very uncomfortable with silence. And so if, they, if they're sitting with someone, instead of just remaining silent, sometimes we, we say silly things because we're uncomfortable 
in that time of silence. And so we do the same thing with God. We believe that silence is unproductive. But silence is very fertile. It allows so many things to happen. So, so I believe, you know, um, just, just sitting there in the presence of God. It's contemplating the presence, contemplating the mystery. Because we, when we enter, sure there are things that we will be saying. But there are other times when we just, we just listen. Um, think about have you ever been by someone's bedside someone who is dying and the person can't talk the person as far as we're concerned the person isn't even aware of our presence but we're aware of being in that person's presence and so you know, so, you know we may put the hand across the forehead, we may stroke the, the hands and what, whatever it is. But it's just being in the presence. Um, there, there's a song that, that they love to sing, especially, you know, I've, I've done a lot of things, you know, but you, you know about the Kairos ministry? that, you know, um, people who go to the prisons and, and so on. Uh, so there's a song that they love to sing during Kairos, when we, um, which is, and Della Reese was the one who made this song popular. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. <laughs> you know, um, I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the touch of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And it's just contemplating that in silence. You know? um, the, there's much more that I could say, but, you know, <laughs> but we'll be here until next week. <laughs> Doing what is right, yes, you know, and because whose law do I follow? The law of God, right? But but my, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be strident and and go because you see, going out there to be militant, fighting, some you know, that's that's not necessarily the the best because what what did Jesus do? Um, when we hear, go, so going back to silence, but, you know, Good Friday we heard from, from Isaiah 52, 53, you know, like a lamb he was led to the slaughter and he opened not his mouth. Hmm? You see? So, yes. Because, you know, um, the thing about that, that even in the church, that sometimes we have to fight. We're fighting for that religious freedom in the church because people, you know, someone may say to you, oh, so why do we have to go to Mass every Sunday? You know, you can, you know, one of your own Catholic persons could say that to you. You know? I remember being told by, by a religious brother when I said, you know, oh, I, I need to, to go to Mass every day and so forth. And his comment was, oh, but according to canon law, you, don't, you, you just have to go Sundays and holy days of obligation. I said, yes, that's what canon law says, but not what my relationship says. The homily is required. So, it, can it then be replaced by a video that hmm? has nothing to do with the liturgy? Uh, 
It depends on what the video is. If the, if the video is something, because the homily can be either of two things. That the homily may be a reflection on the readings of the day, or it can be a reflection on a theme, <laughs> you know, a theme of something, you know. So, um, so, so if there is, for example, the, the time when, when, last Sunday, you know, when there was a proclamation of the, of the year of the Eucharist, there, there was that video from the bishop, you know, and, um, and he must have heard my melodious voice in that video as well. And yeah, just kidding. You know, so, you know, but all of that is part of Glenda's fault. <laughs> yes, but, you know, so like that, but a different kind. So, so something coming from the bishop, yes, but what I mean, if it's uh, another kind of video may not necessarily be what is required, what is allowed. Mm -hmm. Well, St. Augustine says, those who sing, pray twice. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, and so St. Augustine would have been a fan of singing in the, in the liturgy. And, and yes, you know, um, and St. Paul says it, that we should give praise with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. <laughs> So the singing is is important for the for the liturgy. But but if we're going to have leaders of singing, we, we make sure that we have the the best that we have available in the in the you know according to our ability within within the parish. Because you see, so I don't think that because someone says, oh, you know, I, I like to sing, but I can't sing. I'm going to be the, the music leader. <laughs> no. in, in the same way that you're not going to choose the, the person who will go up to count the words <laughs> to be the one to proclaim the readings at, at Mass. You know? Because you want someone to proclaim rather than someone who just gets up there to practice the reading. <laughs> You know, it should be a proclamation. Okay, if no further question then, this is some time that you can spend in your private time. And, and then at 2.30, we will gather in the chapel.